A very good morning, everyone. This is Dr. Parmita Banerjee, a faculty in the Department of Microbiology at Kalinga University and a mentor of Iris Life Sciences. As you know, Iris is an India-based educational and research initiative that aims to build a new generation of creative, passionate, and critical thinking natural scientists through transformative education and research support. Earth and Planetary Science Seminar Series comes under our core activity. So far, we have organized three lectures on planetary sciences and related topics. I hope you all have enjoyed these episodes. If somehow you have missed them, you can just visit our channel and watch the recorded sessions. Now today, it's a great pleasure to introduce Dr. Krishnandu Ghosh for today's seminar. He's a renowned expert in cancer biology with almost 10 years of experience in research ranging from basic to translational approach in his own field. He has an impressive background. He obtained his PhD from Calcutta University. Then he was involved in creating brilliant students in the teaching arena and got himself associated with it. And now he's back into research. He has published numerous research papers and articles and several book chapters and has been invited at several prestigious conferences and events. What fascinates me about Krishnendu is his hobby towards night sky gazing, astrobiology, Egyptology, wandering and exploring nooks of city and countryside. At present, he is a postdoctoral research scholar in the Department of Pathology Carver College of Medicine, University of Iowa, USA. Today, Dr. Ghosh will be sharing his insights on interpolating life through enthralling cosmos, the zera of astrobiology in the scientific horizon, and will provide us with valuable knowledge on this vast topic. Without further ado, please join me in hearing Dr. Ghosh. Krishnendu, the platform is now yours. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Banerjee, or rather Parvita Di. Thank you so much. I think uh, my voice is audible to everyone. Yes, your voice is audible. OK. So let me share my presentation. OK. OK. So, hello everyone. As Dr. Banerjee said, I will be a guide of your today's journey in a very, very fascinating field of science known as astrobiology. Actually, whenever we are talking about astrobiology, there are something that usually comes into mind related to whether it is only a space science topic, only a kind of biological science topic, or a kind of amalgamation, each and everything. And to be very honest, this is a pretty new subject, but a kind of subject with high, high types of potentiality. That's why it will be my pleasure to enumerate some of the basic things of this beautiful subject in the following lecture. So, this will be my first slide. And whenever I uh, talk about this fascinating subject, this is always being my first slide. That is a very, very enormous kind of question. What is life? It's a kind of scientific question. It's a kind of philosophical question. It's a kind of theosophical question, whatever the thing it is. In some cases, some persons like Evan Schreindiger, he kind of made his philosophical comments over the creativity of life. On the other hand, some scientists actually thought of life basically formed due to some building blocks of chemicals, some molecules. And to some utter philanthropist, life means a kind of newborn cuddling around her mother lap. Or quoting Rabindranath Tagore, life means the ultimate echo from the mother nature. 
So we don't know what life actually is. Although from our very beginning, in our school days, in our textbook, we always went through this kind of thing, that what is the basic difference in between the living and the non-living thing. And while making this kind of differentiation, we went through certain characteristics of living thing. A living thing that may be going to reproduce, that may be going to get grown, that is actually having some kind of energy efficiency, that is having some kind of ecological perspective, having been into the food chain, thriving for the energy, having some metabolic activity, so on and so forth. But at the end of the day, each and every portion of this particular thing can get defied. Why? Because you cannot decipher the true meaning of life by some of these ultimate scientific notions. That's why a few years ago, NASA actually proposed a very brilliant kind of definition of life. They propose that it's a kind of biochemical, self-sustainable entity abiding by the Darwinian mode of evolution. We all know that Darwin is the father of evolution, although we know that there are some other excellent scientists before Darwin, including Lamarck. But at the same time, we know that Darwin actually proposed the particular term natural selection. And by the means of the natural selection, evolution got a new window. That is why whenever a particular thing, we can call that a cell, a particular thing, whenever it is actually having its self-sufficiency, whether it is producing its ATP, whether it is actually making some other modes of thing, whether it is reproducing, whether it is making itself a defensive strategy, whatever the thing is. If this is self-sustainable, if it is triggering one after another chain of reaction, and it is actually abiding by the rules and regulations of Darwinian mode of evolution, to be ultimately correct, the neo-Darwinism mode of evolution, if you actually want to add some other portions of the neo-Darwinism here. So that can be said about the life. Now, you might be wondering why I have put these pictures in a talk of astrobiology. Now, what is the common thing in between these pictures? If you follow the junior ones, this one, this guy, and this one, they are all sons and daughters of their star parent, right? Abhishek Bachchan having the father of legendary actor Amitabh Bachchan. This is Jaden Smith, son of Will Smith. And this is Janvi Kapoor, daughter of Sridevi. So whenever we actually look into their life, we become somewhat envy. We really envy their life, isn't it? Because they are star kid. We actually use this term, they are the star kid. But hold on a second. Are only this person's star kid? Not us. Are you sure? Maybe not. Because again, I want to quote Rabindranath Tagore. He wrote once that a small baby was asking to her mother how she came in the, in the earth. And at that point of time, her mother was actually talking about something very, very enigmatic, that there was a star and it fallen apart. And that particular piece actually came into my lab and that was you. Simple, yet a perfect kind of definition that a mother can give to her child. But while making that particular thing, Rabindranath Tagore made a huge, huge impact 
on this very particular field of science why think about the big bang when everything started at one point of time there was nothing except the enormous amount of hydrogen gas cloud gradually there was a big bang and from a gradual momentum in effect it actually became the nebula then the galaxies then the stars first of all the protostars then the stars then the solar system and eventually this planet earth and obviously us so if we are thinking about in a, this way then definitely we the inhabitant of the planet earth definitely came from the cosmos and the cosmos means we can definitely relate to our sun and sun is nothing but a star and each and every kind of organic and inorganic thing that could be found in the earth itself is nothing but being catered from that of the sun and to be very honest from that big bang and if it is so then why not all of us are the star child right so this is how the journey of this astrobiology actually started but as i mentioned at the very beginning this subject is pretty new and when someone like this great great man i think many of you actually know this person carl sagan the legendary carl sagan the writer of the book the cosmos when he proposed that there should be a kind of subject a narrative that will amalgamate both the science of astronomy and the perspective of life how we came how we got evolved is there any other habitable world apart from our own earth there should be a stream of science that should do the proper justice to this ever asked questions but at that point of time many of the scientists thought he just became mad this simply a mad person and no one paid heed to him but time changed and thereafter at the onset of 90s 1990s 92 nasa really thought that yes this is the high time to indulge into a new era of science a new stream of science that would herald the academic horizon and that particular stream of science will be known as the astrobiology or sometimes known as the exobiology so in the late 90s nasa actually proposed a road map what is the field of astrobiology means what are the question that this particular field is going to cater how a person who is very much enthusiastic in this con context could become an astrobiologist if a person is from physics background if a person is from chemistry if a person is from microbiology if a person is from molecular biology can he or she be a part of this fascinating science so while making this kind of road map they actually propose certain questions and for our is i can actually divide the set of questions into two types first how life originated on our own earth number 2 is there any possibility of life apart from our own earth these are the two basic and fundamental question that were asked during the inception of this subject gradually when this particular field of science got much more enriched 
the subdivision of these two basic question got increased like how we can how we evolved how does the evolution works what is the fidelity of the evolution what is the extremity of life and living cells what is the permissible amount of any kind of threshold and at the same time not only the plausibility of life elsewhere in the universe but at the same time how to find them is there really alien species will they be very much primitive than that of us or they are very 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 advanced than that of us so these kind of questions the, this kind of queries they actually started to begin at the inception of this subject so while mitigating this initial questions that nasa actually enlarged the particular pathway to the field of astrobiology and this is a kind of road map that nasa actually suggested regardless of the stream of science regardless of the stream of subject that you are currently belongs to doesn't matter if you are really enthusiastic to know the field of astrobiology all you need to do is to open up your inquisitive mind and thereafter start to read through couple of books there are some good books available in the field of astrobiology then you can make some online courses and thereafter you can actually earn a degree in some of the universities and colleges throughout the globe unfortunately the number of colleges and academic institutes which actually catering the degree that may be bachelor's or masters is very very low but but the chances are there so after you are getting a degree you can diverge yourself in a kind of research amalgamating any other field of science along with the field of astrobiology and from now on you can start to build your own community a kind of community that could be helping you for making a new set of research that would help you to generate a new set of idea you can also enlist yourself to certain type of conferences like the apcrat con astrobiology graduate conference one of the most prestigious conference in astrobiology or apsicon astrobiology science conferences after this kind of thing you can have your whole set of community that is going to get you back up and after that you can look for some funding opportunities then try to interpret some research ideas that might be nice in nature that doesn't matter because whatever the thing you are going to contribute in this particular field this particular part of science is overwhelmingly overwhelmingly going to accept that because it is nice is a very new one so it is our responsibility to follow this particular pathway to enrich this subject regardless of our background and ultimately call ourselves an astrobiologist so that particular road map was being done by nasa and currently each and every institute offering degrees and research in astrobiology is actually abiding by this particular road map so things were starting to get settled up first of all there was no subject then gradually there was a subject and then a kind of blueprint that is going to deal with all the questions 
عبس شبه الذي but next one let's come to the very first thing so there are kind couple of person who are very much interested to know okay is there is any alien when we can where we can find the possibility of life how we can travel to some any other planets because they think this is the core part of the astrobiology on the other hand this is a kind of side portion of astrobiology first of all we have to know the creation of our own how life originated on our own earth because this is the only available model system depending on which we can set ourselves free into the journey of knowing any other existence of life across the universe so that will be our first goal how life originated on earth before going into the life the earth was just a rocky planet we know that we can easily divide all the planets in our solar system into two broad categories the inner rocky planets and the outer gas giants the venus mercury earth mars these are the rocky ones and after that the asteroid belt and thereafter the jupiter saturn neptune uranus these are all the gas giants and whenever you are talking about the rock it means the geological makeup of our earth at the first time the earth was a kind of molten rocky condition just after its birth so after the birth there was a different kind of changes in the geological perspective of the rock and gradually due to various kind of rock cycles the igneous rock the metamorphic rock this kind of different types of rock formation the docker and while the things were going into this direction another parallel thing was also going it is the formation of the earth crust and at the same time the settlement of the earth core so we know that this particular region of our earth if we actually or we can drill through the earth to its core we are going to have some layers of condition the inner core system the outer core system and the very very important portion known as the asthenosphere upon which all the rocky substances all the rocks all the layers are actually being created that is why just over that it is known as the lithosphere litho means the rock and thereafter all the water parts all the soils of the lands everything that's why we sometimes call that the hydrosphere and when this kind of rocks was actually being made another fascinating thing actually took place the formation of continental plates we now know that the earth and all the land masses including the oceanic regions they are actually being placed over some plates huge continental plates some are major plates some are minor plates and these plates are actually are being flowed over the magma and whenever there are some kind of corrosion in this particular region then various volcanic eruption to occur that may be the subduction of the plate that means one portion of the plate gets subducted into another or some kind of friction in between two edge of two different plates that will create various seismological activities that will create various kind of volcanic eruption so isn't it a fatal one 
volcano, earthquake, the lava, these are all a kind of fastidious thing. But no, we are talking about the origin. And somehow these devastations also have some role in the origin of life. Because whatever the metals, whatever the inorganic molecules that are coming out from the deepest portion of the earth through this volcanic eruption are going to get separate above. And then it will create land. And over the land, there will be soil by various kind of weathering process. And the inception of life will begin. So whenever we are dealing with the life in the earth, we should be dealing with the geological perspective first. And same thing applied to any other planet across the universe. Whenever we are going to find some seed of life on any other celestial body, we first need to know about its geological perspective and correlate that with the Earth system. So Earth is a kind of model system. We have to correlate with that. Then, as I mentioned that this kind of continental drift did occur and it is still occurring. So what is the proof? The proof is known as the Pangaea. It is thought that previously the whole art landmass was a single thing, a huge gigantic landmass known as the Pangaea. But due to this kind of continental breakage, each and every continent drifted apart from one another. And how we are going to get this proof? If we carefully look into the Africa and South America, they are just kind of the missing portion of the jigsaw puzzle. You can easily fit one into another. So this is a kind of proof that actually heralding the reality of this kind of continental drift. And along with this continental drift, there is another important thing that relentlessly happened for this particular origin of life, the geological time scale. Since the inception of Earth itself from 4.6 billion years ago, till date, each and every time, how the types of organism evolved, that has been correlated with the geological condition of that particular time. The geologist and the biologist actually divided and subdivided the whole scenario into era, eon, epoch, this kind of thing. And that actually made this kind of map structure, depending on which we can say that this portion was actually being dominated by reptiles. That was the nature when the fish was very much abundant in structure. Like we all know that the Jurassic is the period of the great dinosaurs. That's why the movie came as the Jurassic Park. And after that, we are here. But if you carefully look into this particular structure, you can see that 4.6 billion years is the ultimate age of the earth. But life started to begin at around 2.5 billion. So this enormous amount of time was actually was there, but without any life. It was the formational phase of the earth. As we are talking about this particular creative mode of the earth, its evolution, there were indeed certain kind of destruction. And those destructions were known as the mass extinctions. Many organisms, plants, animals, microbes, they actually got eradicated from the face of the earth due to this severe kinds of extinction process. 
we actually have five mass extinction there and we are actually running through the six in some cases we actually think that there were six mass extinctions and we are running towards the seven it is actually different school of thoughts from different geological perspective and biological perspective but the thing is this kind of mass extinction did happen and even after this kind of mass extinction there was the flourishment of life after each and every mass extinction a new regime of life started to bloom let me tell you a very interesting fact we previously knew that in terms of vertebrate evolution the bird came just after the reptile and then came the mammals but now by analyzing various fossils and various kind of dating processes the radiocarbon dating we now know that small mammals actually arrived long before the birds even when the dinosaur used to roam on the face of the earth but they were very much feared of those dinosaurs that that is why they actually used to live within the caves they used to bury through the soil a kind of adaptation known as the fossorial adaptation but after the mass extinction on to which the dinosaur they got eradicated from earth the flourishment of mammal began so that is the beauty of mass extinction after each and every mass extinction there was a flourishment of life now coming back into the origin of life after all the geological humdrum after all the ecological settlements let's come to the actual possibility of life there were various kind of hypotheses related to the origin of life some actually says about this kind of special creation theory that it is the god obviously i don't know whether god is there or not but i know that there will be some kind of supernatural power that might be god but god created everything and this has been depicted in each and every religion across the world which is nice but at the same time there were some biological perspective regarding this origin of life like the spontaneous creation that suggest that particular a thing came from another one so it's a kind of spontaneous generation that might be biogenesis that might be abiogenesis that means a particular thing came from biological or organic portion or sometime from inorganic portion like this very example in a stack of brick you are suddenly observing that a small sapling is growing and thereafter some insects are coming out from that particular brick stack so what you are going to conclude is it the brick which actually made this life possible no certainly not but at that point of time when the science was not that much developed most of the scientists used to believe this then came the ground breaking experiments of louis pasteur and he actually proved that you have to put some biological thing over some organic or inorganic substance for getting new lease of life in the field of microbiology we know this process as the pasteur principle that's why all the leaves of a petri dish is larger than that of the dish itself because the bacteria cannot move in a zigzag process that's why when he painted that particular portion of the flask there was no growth on the broth but when it was 
broken or it was in a straight condition, there was a growth of bacteria in the clean broth. However, when we are catering the field of astrobiology, there should be some other thing, like these scenarios, the biochemical evolution, the panspermia, and the hydrothermal vent theory. These three theories actually got very much fascinated after the inception of astrobiology. Now, what is panspermia? Pans means everywhere to a large spectrum, and spermia came from the term sperma, seed. And the panspermia means that the life actually started to begin not from the earth itself, not by any particular biochemical reaction, but the life of, sorry, the seed of life actually being seeded elsewhere, maybe from cosmos. So something came from the cosmos and actually bloomed into that particular formidable earth at that point of time, which was in its formational phase, and that actually made life possible. So depending on this particular concept of panspermia, there are three different types. The interstellar panspermia, the ballistic panspermia, and directed panspermia. And while catering this panspermia, there is a beautiful review article published in Biopolymers, and they actually made an hypothesis that how this kind of seed of life flying through the space actually got trapped in the Earth atmosphere at that point of time. And they actually proposed this kind of theory, or rather hypothesis, into which we are kind of inclined to really think of the positivity of this panspermia. Now, about the lithopanspermia. Litho means, as we know, it's a rock. So, according to this particular theory, life came from the space through some rock. That may be meteor, that may be comet, whatever. And that actually dashed again that then earth and then life started to flourish. So the seed of life was actually in a kind of dormant state in that particular condition. And later, when it got bombarded into the earth, the warmth and habitability of the earth made the life possible at that moment of time. And it actually got a proof in the year 2017. And strain object, properly diagnosed at the interstellar object called Oumuamua, caught the attention of the scientist. And they were pretty much sure that it is not from our own solar system. So maybe something like that actually traveled long ago and got bombarded into our and it started the sparkle of life. Even certain journals like Nature Astronomy, they actually supported this kind of thought that really it might be possible for the lithopanspermia to take place on that point of time for the inception of life. Next, there will be the ballistic panspermia. Ballistic means bullet or something which is of very, having very much of speed. It means that life somehow originated in some other planetary bodies, maybe into our own solar system. And thereafter, any kind of disruptive force actually made that thing happen and some rocks or some chunks containing that particular seed of life got bombarded into our Earth. And again, this particular thing also being supported by this Allen Hill meteor that actually got unearthed from an Arctic expedition. And what actually was very much fascinating that scientists found a kind of microbial fossil there, 
a kind of fossil that they claim that it is not belong to any of the known bacteria so maybe it's a kind of martian rock or something and this will give another window in the field of astrobiology that is evolution it is not a synchronous process evolution is a kind of non synchronous process that means if a very advanced kind of evolution is actually running on a planet a it is highly possible that the planet b is just starting at that point of time and the planet c the whole civilization has been wiped out that's why this particular evolutionary concept it is not synchronous at all and last but not the least my favorite it is the direct expanse permia and it states that it is the alien that actually created life in earth no ballistic no interstellar nothing else and it's a kind of it was a kind of experimental ground of some highly advanced alien race and they actually started to show the seeds of life across the universe and we are the crop of that i really don't know what to believe and what not to believe because we don't know nothing sometimes truth is stranger than fiction and what is science fiction today might be a tangible science tomorrow maybe we have to wait till we discover any kind of time travel gadget time machine then we can actually confirm our opinion that it is not this one but that one is the real cause of happening of life on the earth another important thing is the hydrothermal vent which is still present in various portions of our earth and why this hydrothermal vents are important this hydrothermal vents are the small cracks in the ocean surface in the ocean bottoms and these cracks are actually the connective condition in between the magnetic tunnel and the cold water of the ocean so whenever the heated current actually come in contact with the cold condition there will be an immense jet stream of smoke and this particular smoke is actually carrying along with it some inorganic molecules and those inorganic molecules sometime might couple together to form some organic molecules and gradually maybe some cell or cell like components so these are a kind of primitive condition which is still present in some parts of our own art that can be functional as the model portion or model thing to justify the origin of life in our and now it is there are a kind of classification strategy some are known as the black smokers like those actually emitting the iron sulfide or something and the white smoker they are actually endowed with the calcium barium and silicon so we know that depending on the type of smokes they emit the type of inorganic molecules are going to get accumulated and interestingly enough these particular portions are also being summoned by lots of biological communities there are some crustaceans there are some bacteria there are some methane eating bacteria there are some sulfur eating bacteria so it's a whole portion of the decatrum that is actually maybe or might be happen at that point of time during the onset of life on earth so this hydrothermal vent is a kind of good experimental background if we are curious enough to see the real nature of life flourishing in the earth and not only from our art itself 
there are some scientific thoughts that is actually going to correlate how this kind of hydrothermal vent in ancient time might have been present in the Mars itself because we know we are very much curious about Mars, sustainability of life in Mars. Although we don't know whether there is any life or not till date, but we are very, very much enthusiastic about that. And this particular paper actually got this beautiful illustration. And that illustration actually showed us a kind of beehive-like structure within each and every hydrothermal vent. And within this beehive-like structure, all the chemical and biochemical reactions usually take place. By the amalgamation of various inorganic substances, some organic substances to form. And not only that, sometimes this kind of lipid micellar structure or lipid membrana structure, they also tend to form here. So obviously, this kind of condition might be a very handy one to justify the way of life created on Earth. Whenever we are talking about this origin of life, we should be talking about the Operin and Howland concept. Operin and Holden actually thought that when life actually started to form in our Earth, again, I'm rectifying my own quote. I don't know that whether it formed on our Earth or by panspermia, it actually got bombarded into it. But somehow, when the life condition was there, the whole thing was a kind of soupy nature. We know soup is not a very flaccid one, nor a very kind of concentrated one. It's an intermediate condition. So various kind of organic, inorganic molecules, they were actually making some kind of complicated reactions. And by that virtue, a kind of supi condition did origin. Justifying this operin and Holden hot dilute condition, the Ure and Miller tried to perform a groundbreaking experiment. They actually tried to make a primitive art atmosphere. They incorporated certain kinds of gaseous material. They used electrical spark to mimic the thunder at that point of time that will create an enormous amount of energy. And at the end of the reaction, they found certain jelly-like substances containing some types of amino acids. So they proved, kind of proved that by the amalgamation of various inorganic and organic substances, biomolecules can origin. But nowadays, there is some debate related to this Ure Miller experiment. Although there are some certain scientific articles, they still believe that Ure Miller experiment is a kind of groundbreaking experiment. Some other school of thought is actually pointing towards a very, very important thing. Ure and Miller actually used cold water for the concentration of this whole experimental outcome to get that particular jelly-like substance containing the amino acid. But the question is, how on that particular time, cold water actually got formed? Because at that point of time, it was very much heated. And without cold or normal kind of water, this kind of condensation might not be occurring. So this is a kind of flaw that some of the scientists actually try to point out in this particular Ure and Miller experiment. Now, when talking about the water, we know that water is the elixir of life. The simple molecule H2O is really, really a very fascinating one. And we cannot live without water. Our cell needs water. Our biochemical reactions needs water. Our enzymatic reactions needs water. But the question is, what was the ultimate creation of water? How the water came? 
so there are numbers of theories related to this and to be very justified upon that after the big bang there were some nursery of stars known as the nebula and then various kind of galaxy that actually formed and from that galaxy condition there was some protostar there were some planetesimals planet formation planetesimals means the small residues of the planet and that actually created the magic of hydrogen we all know that hydrogen is a magic molecule in periodic table because it has the capacity to quit fuse to form helium then another one lithium another one beryllium that's how it goes so with this particular hydrogen and all this kind of fusion of structure maybe the initial type of water got its origin but interestingly a very new article published in nature actually suggest that they were actually studying upon another kind of creation which is close to the sun itself another star creation and they found that it is not the h2 but the d2 might be the principal formational portion of the water itself and they actually made a kind of simulation from that particular protostar known as the v883 ori and then they actually justified that how condensed t2o might be the initial portion that is going to bind all the planetary mass all the star mass in a single condition and gradually that might be indicating towards how the h2 has been formed from the d2o however at the end of this particular literature they mentioned that this might not be the case in all the condition but it's a very nice experiment that they did and it was the first time that they actually claimed that d2 or the heavy water was the incept inception and that could be the main ground breaking force of the water itself even we are all aware about the fact that the martian lander the perseverance is actually making lots of progress in the jezero crater because it has actually got landed in the jezero crater and now scientists think that jezero crater used to be a delta so again i am saying the same thing maybe evolution started long ago in the mars and then it failed to get enriched in due course of time and after that it started on earth but somehow earth was in a very very nice conditional portion that the evolution didn't stop that is why today i am actually talking to you guys because the evolution process didn't stop and why this thing is ha- actually happened for justifying this we actually put something known as the habitable zone the habitable zone is a kind of zone that is present in a very optimum distance from the main star and that particular planet should be having a liquid form of water here i would like to make a comment we are actually making this statement that life cannot sustain without water because it is the life as we know it there might be life that doesn't need water at all but again we are actually thriving on to our own understanding of the life present in the earth itself that is why whenever we are justifying the habitable zone also known as the goldilocks zone that whenever this kind of celestial bodies are present in a very optimum condition in an optimum distance from the star having the liquid types of water it is a suitable contender for having life 
if it is very far from the star it will be too cold but if it is very near to the star it will be too hot to sustain life on the other hand if the star itself is very bright then this particular habitable world should be here like if we take our example if sun is 10 times bigger than its regular size then maybe are to have been in the position of uranus to harbor the proper seed of life or it is much more dimmer than present condition it might be the venus to be the ideal condition to harbor life so various kind of things are actually present to maintain this habitable zone that is why habitable zone is not an orthodox one habitable zone is changeable that is why depending on various kind of spectral class of the star and what about their intensity their luminosity their heat that is they are going to generate there are some diversification of the habitable zone some scientists love to call them optimistic habitable zone and conservative habitable zone conservative means it is the actual optimum distance from the star itself that is known as the conservative habitable zone but optimistic habitable zone means they might not be in that very optimum region but somehow they might have been managed to secure themselves for getting some aroma of life that is why although being outside the classical habitable zone you can say in our solar system the moon of jupiter europa the moon of saturn enceladus they are some of the strong contenders are having some sort of life there because both of them are having some kind of subsurface ocean although they are very far from star itself from a sun that is but they are having some kind of subsurface ocean that is why there will be some mission known as the europa clipper mission and the juice mission by esa european space agency that is going to make some investigation over the europa the in enceladus there is a peculiar kind of thing that a kind of geyser effect can be seen in its southern hemisphere which is very much unique and that will actually giving us some kind of indication that maybe there are some kind of geological activities there are some kind of cracks within which the water vapors are actually getting dismantled in the space and when the light is getting refracted by that we are having this kind of geyser effect so again what we are actually talking previously the inception of life apart from water we know oxygen is another criteria for life we cannot live even for a minute or two without oxygen but when earth was in its formational phase the percentage of oxygen was very very low very low even lower than that of the carbon dioxide today then something miracle that actually happened the emergence of a kind of organism known as the cyanobacteria and after the cyanobacteria the gradual inclinement of the oxygen level is there and that was the moment when all the other life started to flourish but there was a catch there previously there was lots of bacteria that were compulsorily anaerobic in nature and when the level of oxygen started to rise at that point of time many of those bacteria got wiped out from the face of the earth so whatever the amount of bacteria that we are currently dealing with is almost half of the initial amount because 
many of those bacteria got eradicated during this great oxidation event and there are some certain proofs of this great oxidation event related to the cyanobacteria and other thing and as i mentioned that geology runs parallel with the biology that is why this kind of condition can be watched even in today's art in some kind of geological condition and these geological conditions are known as the strike rock commonly known as the strike rock or strike hematite and in those rocks there will be striping of some iron bands some are oxidized some are not so this particular condition was another enigmatic view of life and the further evolution of it so that was the water then it was the oxygen then the biomolecules and this is an everlasting problem which came first was it the egg or the chicken itself the same thing happens for the evolution of the life itself what was the primordial molecule was it dna the building block or the rna there are loads of proof and loads of antithesis for this in some cases dna might be the suitable factor as it is very much resilient in nature on the other hand rna is not that much resilient on the other hand rna structurally is much more simpler than that of the dna so maybe it was rna and at the same time rna is having another remarkable feature it can catalyze some of its own reaction known as the ribozyme action or the catalytic rna and for this some of them actually started to call the initial inception of the biomolecule as the rna world hypothesis that rna came for the first time however although it is very much speculative that rna and all the other things were associated for the initial formation of the life there were certain contradiction and those contradictions are really fastidious one because that very nature of the rna it's very low level of resiliency so when we were pondering about this thing that whether it is rna or dna another hypothesis came it is neither rna nor dna it was a lipid a lipid was the first mega molecule that formed on earth and it is also having its own proof because we know that each and every cell is having its membrane structure and those membrane structures are made up of lipid there are phospholipid there are glycolipid there are different kinds of lipid and even previously i showed that even in the hydrothermal veins some scientists actually showed that there might be the possibility of making some kind of lipid molecules lipid is an having another great criteria of floating over the water and at that point of time where there's plenty of water maybe lipid was the first painting block krishnan and this lipid huh? Uh, yes. it's only one year uh, one hour over so can you please sum up uh, it's, it's running out of time uh, okay so how much uh, amount of time we are having 10 10 15 minutes max 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 okay uh, i will i will try my best <laughs> so this is a lipid <laughs> i know this is this is the kind of issue about this particular field of science Yes, yes, yes. So this is all about the lipid uh, uh, world hypothesis, and this lipid world hypothesis is also having some kind of support from this particular documentation, and that actually showed that lipid was actually got formed 
not only depending on this kind of micellar structure, but depending on the day and night condition. That during night, that lipid condition, lipid droplets, they formed, and thereafter in the morning condition, they sometimes went at the upper surface of the water, popped up, and again gathered during the night condition. That was another groundbreaking experiment for this. So after all this, we came to know that somehow life started. But what was the life? Virus? No, certainly not. Because virus are intermediate between living and dead. And if there was virus for the first time, who was the host? So nowadays, scientists love to call a particular term known as the LUCA, last universal common ancestor. That from that LUCA, there were some plenty of things. There were some compartment formation within the cell. And that actually transformed LUCA into LECA, last eukaryotic common ancestor. So currently we're having this kind of domain architecture. So from LUCA, there was the bacteria, the archaea, and the eukarya. And within that eukarya, there would be the LECA. And thereafter, all the other proteins and all the other factors were associated with the LECA itself. After everything, it was the evolution. Because as I, as I mentioned previously, evolution never stopped on Earth itself. And the evolution sometimes was divergent, sometimes was convergent, and sometimes was parallel. But regardless of the evolution, it was there. And that is why, quoting Francis Colling, the legendary person behind the Human Genome Project, we can say, the evolution is the God. If someone actually created the life and maintained the life on Earth, it was evolution, it is evolution, and it is always will be evolution. And this is a very primordial drawing, hand-drawn picture from Darwin. And he tried to make the tree of life, how each and everything got evolved. And this has finally been supported nowadays by cutting its scientific proofs. And it suggests that environment is the main driving force for evolution. And not only that, along with environment, genetical predisposition, epigenetical predisposition, developmental criteria, and the ecological stuff, they are all are the fascinating facts of the evolution itself. Another very complicated thing now it is actually occurring in the field of evolution, that is the will force. We know that will force is not a kind of thing that could probably be understandable to understand the evolution. But sometimes, if we can understand this particular thing, we can say maybe evolution is having this particular driving force. This is our appetite, the hunger process. Whenever we are hungry, certain types of hormones, certain type of factors got released in our body. But think if our mood is off, then the opposite reaction will occur and that will decrease our appetite. So if that is being triggered by the willpower itself, the mood itself, then why not the evolution? Although it's a very kind of debatable issue. So next, where you can find the habitable place? This is all about the art itself. Now, the second portion, where we can find the other portion, other thing. But for that, we need to have some models. And especially these models are the bacteria, but these are not any common bacteria. These bacteria are known as the extremophiles because they can withstand some extreme condition in the art itself. And so that we can actually paint them in any other celestial body, with lots of this kind of condition. That might be thermophile, that might be halophile, acidophile, this kind of thing. Even, this is the tardigrade, the water bears, this is a kind of eukaryotic extremophiles. They are also being served as the model for the astrobiology. Now, where to look into? Thankfully, there are some powerful land-based telescopes the Kepler Space Telescope and recently launched the James Webb Space Telescope, there are almost more than 5,000 of exoplanets. We are not talking about our own solar system. We are talking about the exoplanets. 
planets present outside our own solar system and many of them are indeed a kind of habitable one at least we can guess so but they are very very far in nature that's why we need to wait for the further upliftment of our scientific advisory for getting actually there so there are a couple of missions and these missions are actually triggering and digging the deep into the finding of life that may be oscillatory strix friction this is actually was going on on the asteroid binu and then it was the europa clipper mission this was the ocean world mission that means the europa and other thing so there are lots of missions that are actually coming soon in the academia and that will shed some more light over the habitability in any other celestial body also we need to thank this parker solar probe because they are actually it is actually scanning sun from its very close condition and that will also give some other criteria for our solar system itself and that might be handy for understanding life in the solar system also venus is a great contender for having maybe a like kind of life although it is very much hot in condition there was a kind of finding of phosphine in the late 20 and early 2021 in the venusian climate although it is full of sulfuric acid but that sulfuric acid vapor is very gradually nature it is actually found in some particular conditional part in the venusian atmosphere and maybe there might be some kind of uh, extremophilic bacteria acidophilic bacteria that can live so this kind of thing is actually serving the main mission of the astrobiology and there are also some uh, analog sites present in the art itself like the yellowstone hot spring here the condition is very hot and, and we can actually study the types of organism that are present in the yellowstone or the concordia resuscitation in antarctica it is very cold in nature and if any kind of organisms are there then we can actually think that life may sustain in the space condition along with that there are some cutting edge microgravity research because these are the thing that are actually coming into contact with the astrology research presenters like the space medicine microgravity is a condition that is seemingly looking like a very funny thing but actually it tells upon our bone and muscular system and there are certain system that actually there are certain study were being drawn and that showed that it actually tells upon our cytoskeleton system even the jackson lab the very famous lab in the us jackson lab they actually made a kind of study over the mice bone structure and they saw in the gravity of earth there are lots of osteoclastic cells but the number of osteoclastic cell has been increased in the microgravity condition and that will result into deformity of the bone so this is the kind of ground breaking condition in the microgravity research also there are some cancer related research and the stem cell related research in the field of microgravity that are actually being catered in the international space station how the cancer cells are going to respond in the microgravity condition space medicine medicine is also related to the radiation research itself because we know radiation is a mutagenic thing and how an astronomer or any kind of condition is going to survive in this radiative condition that is going to be a very interesting things to find and uh, thankfully i actually uh, made this kind of a proposal in the apsicon 2022 that dinococcus radio durans a kind of radiation withstanding bacteria can be used for making the future space suit in the space no, astronaut there are some other thing that this kind of space condition can actually tells upon the mental condition and other kind of cellular condition that's why this space research is actually getting a cutting edge in course of time last but not the least this is a very new thing in astrobiology known as the para astrobiology something which is not properly known yet we are guessing for that and this is mainly related to the alien condition 
do alien exist? How we are going to code, communicate with them? Do they often visit? Thankfully, there are lots of things that actually being very much inquisitive and very much uh, vindictive towards the presence of the alien. That might be some Hollywood flicks. That might be even some tangible books like this Chariot of God by Eric von Daniken or some certain actually present areas in art like the some island in the Eastern Island, this kind of monstrous statue. Who made this and why? this kind of enormous structure has been made. What is the background force for making this kind of face or the Area 51 in Nevada that's supposed to have some alien ship or even the Egyptian hieroglyph where some odd kind of symbols that actually depicted as presence of alien life. We don't know. But here, Farmi gave a beautiful thing. It is known as the Farmi paradox. Farmi told, that there is a lot of planet just like art full of aliens and they can easily come into our art. But the only problem is, is that distance. That is why we are somehow we saved from this alien. Later, Drake gave a groundbreaking equation. And this equation is actually known as the Drake equation. And he actually formulated this funny kind of equation that actually state that it is a very, 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 very low amount of chance of having a very advanced kind of alien civilization that is going to come into our earth for kind of conquering on itself. And sorry, if we want to really want to contact or make communication with them, there are something like the SETI, the search for extraterrestrial intelligence. They are actually making some good kind of research in the field of alien biology, I might say. And they are using their large radio telescope for making any kind of contact with alien. And the Arecibo message that was sent from in the 1974, this is a kind of coding message and that actually having some signature thing from art, like the numbering system, like the some building, materials of our life, some nucleotides, and then the human, the our, our solar system, this kind of thing. And also, this is a very interesting thing, the wow signal that are actually being found in Ohio, the name of the telescope were big here. It was received in 1977, a peculiar type of signal and when the receiver, the receiving person received that, he actually wrote their wow. And from that, it was known as the wow signal. And also we know that the Voyager, both the Voyager 1 and Voyager 2, they, they are having this kind of golden disk. And many languages were being recorded on that particular disk. And currently, both the Voyagers have crossed our solar system. And sometimes they send some peculiar kind of sound, although we cannot say that those are the alien sound, but yet, unless and until all of these two voyages were dead, we might be expecting some kind of thing. So lastly, this kind of civilization, if we are going to find any alien civilization, what it would be? So thanks to this Nikolai Kardashev, he actually made this kind of scale known as the Kardashev scale it actually depicts the amount of energy that that particular civilization is going to use. And depending on that, that could be type one, type two, or type two civilization. We are just inclined towards the type one. And if it is type two, then we should be using all the energy from the sun. And if it is type three, then that particular civilization is going to use all the energy from the galaxy. Currently, there are some papers that actually increase the Kardashev scale into type 13, type 14, type 20 type of civilization. They actually subdivided the whole thing. And also this one, this Dyson sphere, it is another kind of hypothetical thing that if an Indian civilization is very much advanced in science, they can build this kind of condition that can actually use more amount of star energy and its light for their upliftment. We are 
still to find any kind of this, but these are the hypothetical alien signature. So all this thing along with these things like the international space law, this is another part of the astrobiology where each and every nation should be having some typical law for various kinds of space expedition. And these laws are also related to the space pollution itself. So we don't know whether aliens are going to come and annihilate us, but we are actually making good amount of space debris. Maybe this is going to make some kind of bad thing to our art itself. So we should be very much watchful to reduce the space jumps and international space law is one of the governing sector that is actually going on to this. So after this, I am going to rest my talk here. Sorry for the last few slides. I really had to make very fast. Thank you so much. So I'm really open to get some questions. Thank you. Uh, hello, uh, Kishan, this is a beautiful uh, presentation. Uh, uh, we have thoroughly enjoyed your talk. Uh, it's a Thank really you. fascinating to know uh, uh, new things uh, uh, to me, actually, and uh, for the audience also, because I know uh, audience are mostly they are from geoscience background. And for us, uh, knowing this biological science uh, and its implications to, uh, in space and also geology, it's really uh, a new thing for uh, Thank you. Thank so, you. Uh, actually, we actually, when just uh, we, are, uh, we are talking, it's kind of a time time traveling. We're experiencing the time traveling. You've just grown across the <laughs> length of this subject. Started from that uh, origin of life and evolution of life. Then you uh, uh, talk about the SETI, uh, SETI, life, and everything. <laughs> it's a full uh, the content was really very fantastic. So uh, I have a... a a small question it's an interesting question but it's in my mind that is uh, if we uh, if humanity is actually going to search for uh, extraterrestrial life uh, or i mean to say uh, the ancient life form so uh, what could be that uh, the condition means what the place actually actually we tar we target and uh, from where we can expect the life from preserve uh, either in main condition right. or in real condition, which condition is most favorable for life? Right, uh, right. It's a nice question. So first of all, definitely marine condition will be preferential, but it is not the ultimate. Because as I mentioned before, this kind of hydrothermal veins are a really good site for getting any new clues to life. And at the mm -hmm. same time, there might be some permafrost because kind of biological thing that is covered through ice and any kind of Arctic excavation might also be a searchable area for life or some hot spring because we know there are some certain bacteria uh, because uh, in biology we are very fond of doing a particular technique known as the PCR, polymerase chain reaction. And that PCR is having an enzyme known as the TAC polymerase. It actually comes from a bacteria known as the thermos aquaticus that is found in the hot spring area. So if those kind of bacteria are found in the hot spring and their DNA are not being damaged by the heat itself, so maybe this kind of areas are potential for searching any kind of life. Okay, and I have another question that is, uh, uh, as you mentioned that uh, the oxygen actually played an important role to uh, actually uh, try the life, uh, modern life. But uh, you know that uh, without oxygen, we have life forms in, uh, in Precambrian. At Th the time, the oxygen level was very much low. So why uh, this oxygen is actually uh, required? means uh, without oxygen also there is life. So why we consider okay. oxygen so much? Okay. The thing is, there are some other organisms, even in present Earth, that that don't require oxygen. They don't require oxygen at all. And those are the anaerobic bacteria. So the organisms are there. But if you're actually having the number, 
the number of the aerobic organism are much more than that of the anaerobic why because oxygen is having a very nice condition the oxidation because our cell is actually having a kind of condition and love to get oxidized each and every kind of biomolecule love to get oxidized that is they are jumping from one energy state to another and this is this is actually being governed by the laws of thermodynamics so within our body when the atp the main power molecule it is being formed from adp thereafter from atp and then atp divided into adp and phosphate this kind of condition is actually very much preferable for any life to harbor and for the growth of cell for the division of cell and if that particular cell is trying to make a progress that's why there is a kind of speculation that when uh, eukaryotic cell originated for the first time there was no mitochondria the main power house of the cell there was no mitochondria and they were very sluggish in nature but at that point of time on one fine morning one particular eukaryotic cell engulfed one purple bacteria and that actually evolved to be mitochondria and started the oxidative reaction and that actually expedited the whole growth of the process that's why oxygen is a kind of deciding factor oh uh, thanks thanks for your reply uh, uh, and we ha uh, have a question from mohina uh, sinha he asked uh, when we set out in search of life in the cosmos or some other planet do we presume that uh, that it has to be a carbon based life no no definitely not definitely not i again uh, thank you mohina for your question i actually want to remember you one of my say that we know life as it is we know that we are carbon based but it is not like that that each and everything will be carbon based in the entire universe some might be silicon based because we know silicon has the capacity just like the carbon in that might be silicon based although silicon is having some kind of drawback but might be there might be some nitrogen uh, or ammonia based organism we don't know this so definitely we cannot set ourselves to a particular goal like all the life throughout the universe will be carbon based definitely not uh thanks uh, krishnan do and uh, i have one uh, uh, common questions means uh, uh, audience may ask that uh, if someone wants to uh, do career uh, started their career in astrobiology so astrobiology is a very uncommon subject in india uh, there is no school particularly for uh, teaching astrobiology or uh, doing research particularly yes. it's very rare uh, for geoscience and biology science bio bio sciences so who are interested to do their to do some uh, career opportunity in astrobiology for to use your suggestion right 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 that's why that's why on the very uh, first portion of this uh, lecture i actually show all of you the yeah. road map of nasa yeah. uh, so it doesn't matter right yeah. so it doesn't matter it doesn't matter which subject you are currently belonging to if you are from geoscience if you are from bioscience you just pursue on your own field of science and mm -hmm. then you can interpolate your understanding for the field of bioscience even in india there are certain labs that are actually doing some kind of research in astrobiology particularly i can name one or two labs like iser uh, pune that is that is uh, sudha rajamani dr sudha rajamani's lab and the name of her lab is cool chemical origin of life and mm -hmm. she is actually doing cutting edge research in astrobiology in india and to be you should be surprised to know that she is not having any background in astrobiology she did her phd in immunology and did her post doc in neuroscience but now she is doing research in astrobiology even the birbal sahani institute they are actually having one or two 
uh, faculty members that are actually thinking of astrobiology. So in Isa Kolkata, there is one or two faculty members. They are actually gearing up for the astrobiology. So I know the chances are very scarce here, but there will be a time and we can start from now. Is there any courses? Uh, is there any... Uh... Uh, uh, like a master's or bachelor's or any uh, not not yet not yet there are some online platforms there are no online courses the, mm. those are diploma and some programs and mm. there is a kind of master's program run by the amity university mumbai which is the kind mm. of which is recognized but apart from that i don't know if there is any ugc recognized courses there satyabhama institute uh, may be starting astrobiology masters after one or two years maybe as far as i know okay uh, thanks thanks for your uh, for your nice uh, presentation krishnandu i think uh, uh, audience do you have any question uh, you can ask uh, directly to uh, dr ghosh uh, and or you can uh, try to write, write to that uh, director at uh, that i.com Okay. Right, right. That will be also nice. If they are having any question, they can write to the director and I'll be getting yes. in touch to them. Yes. And uh, we have circulated a, a Google form uh, to everyone. Please fill it up and uh, just submit that form so that we can uh, give you the certificate of attendance. So thanks. Thanks for joining us today. Uh, have a nice day. Uh, thanks, Krishandu. One second. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thanks.